Hello and welcome to Mystery Made Known, primers about all things Jesus and the Gospel. And in this video, we're considering spiritual hunger and thirst for the love of God. A hunger and thirst that leads to the utter fulfillment and satisfaction of all the needs and desires we are originally created for. We've probably all heard the old saying, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make it drink. Of course, this means that you can provide something that another person requires, but you can't make them receive it. It's a pretty universal dynamic, and we've probably all experienced it in one way or another, either as the ones who do the leading, so to speak, or maybe even as the horse. Of course, the implication is that the person, the horse, doesn't experience the benefits of what is being provided. Whether parents with children, doctors with patients, social workers with clients, teachers with students, the application is almost endless. But the particular context I'd like to cover here is of creator and creature. What Jesus and the Gospel leads us to, and the spiritual hunger and thirst required to receive it. In terms of hunger and thirst for God, we need look no further than the songs King David wrote in the book of Psalms. In Psalm 63, David writes, You, God, are my God. Earnestly I seek you. I thirst for you. My whole being longs for you in a dry and parched land where there is no water. <laughs> now, this is obviously not the stuff of routine pedestrian religious practice. This is somebody who has not only been led to the water, but who has drunk deeply of it. David goes on to write, I have seen you in the sanctuary and beheld your power and your glory because your love is better than life. My lips will glorify you. I will be satisfied as with the richest of foods, with singing lips my mouth will praise you. Wow, God's love, better than life itself. Now there's something worth talking more about. Now I'm struck that David didn't write that God's provision or protection or favour was the most attractive thing, but rather the love of God, a love he says is greater than life itself. This is so important to David that he throws everything after it. He says that his whole being longs for God. This is not the words or sentiments of abstract mundane religious practice. This is deeply passionate, faith full of spiritual vitality. How is it that David is like this? Well, the clue is in what he writes. He writes, I have seen you in the sanctuary and beheld your power and your glory. There's the answer. David had had a personal encounter with God. He had in some fashion met with God. And what was it about God that impacted David the most? What is he spiritually hungry and thirsty for? The love of God. Now, we shouldn't be surprised to find that this passion, this spiritual hunger and thirst is grounded in the love of God, and so is at the heart of all things Jesus and the Gospel. If you like, the whole of the Gospel is God the Father leading us through Jesus the Son by his Holy Spirit, leading us to spiritual food and drink. Jesus actually said, whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Elsewhere, he said, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me 
will never be thirsty. But sadly, in this second case, many, we're told, it says many of his disciples simply didn't have the spiritual hunger and thirst to pursue after what Jesus was talking about. They simply turned and walked away unsatisfied. So even many who confessed and followed Jesus simply didn't have the spiritual hunger and thirst to pursue what God the Father offers through Jesus. So spiritual hunger and thirst should not be taken for granted. And one thing is for sure, the satisfaction of this hunger and thirst can only be achieved by pursuing and receiving what God is offering in and through Jesus. And what exactly is being offered to the human race, to you and me, in and through Jesus and the Gospel? <laughs> Here we come across the most astonishing of realities, what I consider as the most breathtaking truth that the Bible claims. In and through Jesus, by the Holy Spirit, God the Father is offering you and me, offering the whole human race, everything. Now, that does need further explanation. Way up at the top of any list I have of favourite parts of the Bible is chapter 8 of Paul's letter to the church in Rome. At the end of this chapter, Paul basically throws at us the greatest consequences of what Jesus and the Gospel is all about. Paul writes, He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Let me say that again. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? This is the most breathtaking truth that if God didn't withhold what's most valuable, why would he withhold anything else? Or to put it the other way around, if he has given us the greatest, most valuable thing in his possession that he can give his beloved son, why would he withhold anything of less value? And so here is the reality that God gives us everything along with Jesus, everything for the life he created us to live. This is astonishing. This water, so to speak, that God leads us to utterly satisfies the deepest human appetite and need. And the end of Romans 8 confirms what King David understood. It's all about the love of God. It reads, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble, or hardship, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword? As it's written, For your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any power, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Did you notice that the satisfaction of this spiritual hunger and thirst, the encounter with the love of God, it doesn't necessarily avoid or exclude exposure to the hardships of life. In fact, quite the opposite. But what it does do is this. It enables those with spiritual hunger and thirst to persevere through and endure the challenges of life. As the text says, to have victory over them. 
just as we're told that Jesus was made perfect through suffering for revealing and making possible the godly life in everything he said and did, so it is for those who follow Jesus. The person who refuses to eat and drink tends to desire God to be merely their remover of problems and hardships. But the love of God that spiritual hunger and thirst receives carries a person through the darkest valley with peace, joy and thanksgiving in all circumstances. So what's the alternative to all this? The refusal to eat of the food and drink that God has brought to us in Jesus. Well, this results in simply trying to satisfy our human appetites and needs elsewhere. This looks like trying to fulfill what we need in relationships, careers, wealth, status, hobbies and pastimes. This even includes much, but not all, religious practice. But ultimately, these things will never satisfy. They all miss the mark, which is the basic meaning of sin. Only the love of God in Jesus and the th all things that comes with him, only this provides the healthy satisfaction of the deepest of human needs. So only repenting of, that's turning away from, the futility of self-centered looking elsewhere, only in turning towards the love of God with hunger and thirst for him, do we find freedom and fulfillment. Now I've got to admit, pondering the all things God offers takes me way beyond what I can comprehend. But I can comprehend this, nothing else compares. So here are you and I before the food and drink that Jesus and the gospel has led us to. Do we have the spiritual hunger and thirst to eat and drink of it? Or will we just turn and continue to try and find satisfaction elsewhere? Well, the truth that seals the deal for me in all this is this. If God offers it to us, that means that you and I are totally capable of receiving it. But it seems I can only receive the life God wants me to have with him by letting go of the life I've been living without him. There is no halfway house here, no compromise, no hybrid following of Jesus. Like King David, I have to give my whole being, recognizing that the love of God in Jesus is better than life itself. So I pray that you'll be able to understand all this. I pray that the proverbial penny will drop, the truth will dawn on you. I pray that you'll be able to recognize where you're trying to find satisfaction in the wrong places. I pray that you will discover through the Holy Spirit the spiritual hunger and thirst you were created for and the full satisfaction of this hunger and thirst through the love of God in Jesus.